Muy buenas tardes, mi nombre es Daniel Rodríguez Barrón, soy escritor mexicano, les agradezco mucho que nos estén acompañando ahora mismo en estas charlas que tenemos entre el Grupo Planeta y desde luego la FIL de Guadalajara, para mí es un honor eh, charlar con Camila Lackmer, la reina de las novelas criminales, le agradezco muchísimo a Camila que esté con nosotros esta tarde, gracias Camila. Thank you. Me gustaría comenzar, eh, antes de, de entrar realmente en la trama de la novela, vamos a tener un, 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 un tiempo un poco largo, y entonces vamos a disfrutar esta charla. Me gustaría empezar por preguntarte por qué, por qué eh, eh, los países nórdicos se han convertido en un polo, digamos, de atracción en lo que se refiere a la novela negra. Si hay alguna razón eh, sociológica, que no sea, digamos, editorial, por la cual estos países se han convertido en un, en un punto de atracción de esta clase de novelas. I think there are several factors. One is the climate, I think, the long, cold, dark winters, <laughs> which leaves much for the imagination to, to write about. Um, I also think that we have, um, I'm going to quote a colleague of mine, Lisa Marklund. Uh, she said that um, you have to have a blank canvas to be able to write about murders and horrible things like that. In countries with a, a, an ongoing war, for example, there's not as much interest in writing stories about, you know, everyday murders, or you have to have a special kind of society. And the Scandinavian society is quite a safe society. So I think the crime stories are the ghost stories that we tell around the campfire. <laughs> uh, and I also think that uh, when it comes to Nordic crime, Nordic noir, uh, we were lucky enough to have a fantastic couple that started uh, writing crime and totally changed the name of the game and the genre mm -hmm. in the 80s. And they have very difficult names to pronounce. Sjöval Vala, the Martin Beck stories. Mm -hmm. And they really up the game and raised the bar of writing crime stories and brought it into literature. Uh, it was not something you read under the covers anymore. It was brought into the world of literature. So I think all of those factors combined have created the fantastic uh, success of Scandinavic noir, Nordic noir. Entonces hay un, una, digamos, una doble relación. La, la idea de que es una sociedad eh, más igualitaria y que quizás entonces los crímenes resultan ser más escandalosos por eso, por eso mismo. Y la otra porque quizás los escritores comenzaron a, a elevar el género policiaco. Es decir, era un, era un género bastante popular que uno leía, como acabas muy bien de decir, casi con vergüenza y se convirtió en gran literatura. ¿Es así? Yes, and we have uh, we have been fortunate enough to have a lot, a long line of fantastic authors who decided to write crime. One name, for example, is Henning Mankell, who also contributed to raising the respect for the crime genre. Uh, so I think it's very also much due to the fact that we've had some fantastic literary writers who decided to take on crime writing. ¿Es un entretenimiento o es una crítica a la sociedad contemporánea? No solo a aquella donde, donde tú habitas, sino a la sociedad en general. A lot of uh, crime writers, authors have had an agenda and they've been very outspoken with the agenda they've had with what top topic in society they want to enlighten with their crime writing. I kind of started out going the other way. I've always with vigilance said that I write primarily to entertain. I think that's a beautiful thing. I think that's nothing to be ashamed of. <laughs> so I've always said that I do not have a topic. I do not have criticism of society, but that being said, Uh, I realized through the years and I've gotten older and wiser and more experienced as well and more aware of what goes on in the world and the society around me 
um, I've, I, I realized it's very hard to write books in a, in a vacuum, in, in nothingness. Of course, I write about the things that upset me, that angers me, that gets me passionate. Um, so we all include that in our books. Claro. Hay, algún, hay una necesidad también a veces de, de ocultar esta idea de que uno quiere entretener con lo que escribe. Parece como si fuera algo, algo vergonzoso, yeah. como si el entretenimiento fuera un asunto de la televisión o de las series y no tuviera que ver con el libro. Sin embargo, tú lo llevas muy bien a cabo. Te permite divertirte súper entretenido lo que, lo, que, lo que leí anoche de un solo tirón pero al mismo tiempo sí haces esa, esa, esa crítica en específico, ¿no? Entonces, yo te quería preguntar, ¿está enmarcado el libro claramente, lo citas, en el, en el Me Too? Eh, ¿Qué te interesa del, del Me Too antes de entrar en la novela? ¿Qué te interesa de este movimiento? Creo que el Me Too movement happened right around the same time as I had my own awakening about women's... Uh conditions in the world. And I think that um, also is combined with, I mean, I, I turned 40, um, which had a great impact on me on the way I view the world. And my oldest daughter um, turned 16 and is, you know, approaching, mm -hmm. entering the real world. So I started seeing the world with her eyes, the world she's going to enter into. And I realized that, oh my God, my daughter does not have the same um, possibilities as my sons do. I have two daughters and two sons. And I mean, even in Sweden, everyone thinks we're totally, totally equal. No, 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 no. Even in Sweden, my sons have a lot of pri privileges just because they're boys, men. Uno pensaría eh, claramente que, que, que en Suecia uno tendría o, o podría ver estos términos de igualdad muy claramente. Sin embargo, parece ser que no, por lo que leo en, en Mujeres que no perdonan. Uno, uno creería que la tradición, no, no sé, no sé si, te, si, si te interese o quizás haya, haya algo que ver en la cultura, en la cultura nórdica que que eh, Ibsen con las, con las mujeres de, de, de Casa de Muñecas y con Keda Gabler hubiera empezado una suerte como de, de protofeminismo, no sé si, si, si es, ese sería el término correcto, y quizás uno imagina desde acá, desde América, desde, desde nuestros países que apenas están avanzando en ese tema, que ustedes estaban mucho más avanzados, pero parece ser que tienen un poco los mismos problemas. Yeah, I would say that Sweden is more equal than most countries in the world. I would definitely, on a scale, I would say that Sweden is more equal, but we're far, far from, from equal. Uh, I mean, uh, we have a world that is built on men's wants, needs, desires, wishes, rules. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're in Sweden, if you're in Mexico, you're in France, you're in the United States. It's a man's world and women are starting to react to that because we're getting the bad bargaining. We have gotten more rights. We have the right to be in the workforce, but we are not at the same um, rate being able to let go of the household chores. We're still supposed to do most of the work at home and take the most care of the children, but at the same time perform as good or probably better than men. So we're getting the, the, you know, the bad end of the stick. And you know, when you sp speak of Ibsen, the interesting thing is that when I was a teenager and I was in a gymnasium and that it's after high school before university, we had essay writings, of course, as you do in all schools. And we had a free essay writing. We could choose to write at this particular instant what we wanted. And I had just read um, A Doll's House Is that the English title by yes. Ibsen? And I was so intrigued by that. But the teenage me, the 16-year-old me, decided to write uh, what happened. Um, I mean, the sequel, what happened <laughs> after she left, what happened. And in my story, it was a short story. It was only a few pages. In my story, she returns. She goes back. 
because she realizes that there's no place in the world for her. She has no choice but to return to the cage she just uh, escaped. Um, <laughs> and that is very interesting now for me, who's 46, to read that and see what my view of the world was. In my eyes, she was trapped. She could not leave. Eso no lo hubieran pensado jamás las mujeres que no perdonan el, el tener que regresar a, a casa porque no se sienten seguras en el mundo o porque les da miedo o porque no encuentran este, posibilidades. Quiere decir que ha pasado un largo, un largo trecho yeah. en, tu, en tu ideología. Bueno, me gustaría contarte que en México, eh, y es una de las preguntas que quiero hacerte, eh, en México eh, también el movimiento #MeToo ha tenido mucha, reper mucha repercusión. El movimiento feminista tiene, tiene un desarrollo bastante amplio, pero al mismo tiempo ha sido eh, tristemente criminalizado. En, en los últimos días, en Cancún, una protesta feminista ha sido dispersada con, con, a balazos. Eh, ¿Por qué tememos tanto ese cambio? Es, esa es mi pregunta. ¿Por qué tenemos miedo de que, de que las mujeres eh, tomen el poder o se conviertan en, 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 en conductoras de sí mismas, de su propia voluntad y de sus propios derechos? ¿Qué es lo que tememos? I don't think this is a mystery at all. I mean, when in the history of humanity has someone with power voluntarily relinquished that power, the ones who have the power will do everything they can to keep that power. Uh, and it's the same thing if you're a man or if you're Caucasian or if, you know, it doesn't, or if it's a country or if you're Louis XIV, Um, I mean, I'm, probably Louis XIV also said that re this revolution went too far. <laughs> I mean, the people in power always, because that's what you hear also here in Sweden, in Scandinavia, and Scandinavia, well, the whole Me Too thing has gone too far. You know, the people in power who are about to lose some of that power will always think that the revolution has gone too far and they will defend it with every means they have. So to me, it's not a mystery. Entremos a, a mujeres, a mujeres que no, que no perdonan. Eh, hay una tradición, se trata sobre la justicia o sobre la venganza. Te, sería mi primera pregunta. ¿Justicia o venganza? I think it's all about that. And when you talk about vengeance and revenge, Again, we're talking about power. We always come back to power. When someone does something to you, they take power from you. And when you take revenge, you take back some of that power. And that's something that has always intrigued me. And I mean, mankind has always been intrigued by this. We have the stories about revenge and vengeance already in the Bible, probably before that. I mean, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. There's tons of stories about revenge in the Bible. Um, and so it's, it's something that is, sometimes even the fantasy about power can make you feel a little bit better. Even if you don't do the things you fantasize about, it's a bit cathartic to actually fantasize about getting back at someone. Me gusta que haya citado a la Biblia porque una de las cosas que pensaba mientras leía la, la novela es que hay una gran tradición de venganza femenina. Eh, los griegos está Medea, está Clitemnestra y está Judith, por ejemplo, en la Biblia. Sin embargo, ¿qué diferencia encuentras entre estas, entre estas venganzas eh, eh, de la antigüedad, digamos, de la, de la literatura antigua frente a las venganzas de la literatura contemporánea? I mean, of course, the stories have adapted to, to society, but we do still see the kind of revenge in modern society that you see. I mean, we see the Medea stories. We see the, the mothers killing their children or the fathers killing their children. We had a case in Sweden with um, a father who burnt down the house with his three children in it and texted his 
soon to be ex-wife, like now I got you. Uh, so we mm. still unfortunately have these stone age um, stories, but of course they've also adapted to modern society. Uh, I've written a book, um, well, two books actually about a character named Faye, Golden Cage and Wings of Silver. And uh, she goes the corporate way, you know, destroying through taking over business, <laughs> the dynasty, the Dallas version of <laughs> hostile takeovers. So you have everything from that to, you know, gunpoint murdering someone as a revenge and everything in between. Tenemos a tres protagonistas, Victoria, Brigitta y Ingrid. Tenemos a tres protagonistas a lo largo de la novela que eh, son diferentes, en, eh, tienen diferencias en edades, tienen diferencias incluso, yo diría, culturales. Una de ellas es una periodista que, que me parece que es casi el centro de la, de la trama. Pero, ¿por qué elegiste estas, a, estas, a estas mujeres? ¿Cómo creas estos personajes? Well, it was very deliberate that I made them very, very different because my whole point was that sometimes we get this stereotypical idea of which woman who is subject to being, um, you know, put down by a man. And we don't think that I would never be in that situation or someone like that would never be in this situation. We have the situation where you have like upper class people and you think everything looks so nice on the outside and nothing like that would ever go on in nice families like that. The thing is that spousal abuse, for example, happens in all kinds of social economic family mm -hmm. status i mean it's upper class it's lower class it's middle class it's poor it's it's rich it's educated non-educated um it, it's very you know non-racial that way it doesn't feel any you know race or gender or i mean well it's mostly men who are the abusers but uh, so gender was the wrong choice of word but um It, it really cuts through everything. And that was a very, very important point for me. Sí, a mí también me lo, me lo pareció y me gustó mucho porque una de las cosas que se hace para, para desdeñar o para disminuir la, la fuerza del movimiento feminista, es decir, esto solo, solo ocurre en las clases bajas. Nunca va a ocurrir en ningún otro espacio, nunca va a ocurrir con una mujer letrada, con una mujer escritora, con una mujer periodista, eso no va a ocurrir jamás. Y esa es en realidad una forma como de desarmar el movimiento y de quitarle importancia. Y tú lo que haces es justo intentar que estas mujeres sean estudiadas, sean de una clase social en donde idealmente estas cosas no pasarían. Entonces, eso te permite además, eh, yeah. digamos, enganchar al lector. I do think it helps me engage the reader because you always, always also have this recognition that that you're able to put yourself in the shoes of the character. It's not us and them. And another point I want to make with these women is that there's this wrong notion that it's only weak women who are subject to abusers. And you know, people say things like, oh, but why didn't she just leave? Uh, they do not understand the mechanism at all. And very, very strong women have been caught up in abusive relationships. It doesn't have anything to do with strength or character. It's a very sinister way of, you know, picking someone apart and putting someone down. That happens often over years. And that was also a very, very important point for me to make. Estamos hablando de los, de los personajes femeninos, pero también es muy interesante los, los personajes masculinos porque está el típico patán borracho, pero al mismo tiempo el abusador puede ser el periodista que es director de un periódico y que debería tener todas las herramientas para entender este nuevo mundo, este nuevo mundo del Me Too, este nuevo feminismo, y sin embargo no lo no lo hace. También eh, pensaste muy bien, supongo, estos, estos caracteres masculinos. Yeah. Also, another point I wanted to make that, because you often also hear that, oh, but he seems such a nice guy. He could never have done that. It's not about being smart. It's not about being educated. Educated men beat their spouses. Smart men beat their spouses. 
men who are can be good fathers and nice with friends and still beat their spouse. Uh, you know, you have to make people understand that people ha can have two thoughts uh, in the head at the same time. And um, again, it's about power. It's not about smart education, money, whatever. It's about power. Some people just for whatever reason, from their childhood or just being born a certain way, we don't know yet. Just, you know, get a kick out of having power over someone. It makes them feel more empowered and strong and important. Y supongo que esto se subraya, esta necesidad de poder, quiero decir, eh, se subraya frente a estos movimientos porque precisamente, aparentemente, o, o, o en unos casos, por ejemplo, en el, en, el, en el trabajo, en la oficina, no aparentemente, sino realmente, estamos perdiendo lugares, eh, posiciones de poder los, los hombres. Y quizás entonces la violencia vuelve a ser un, un, una forma en la que respondemos eh, eh, automáticamente, ¿no es así? Sí. Estos, estos personajes... It's a lashing eh, out. It's, it's like when you take a favorite uh, toy from a child and he lashes out and gets angry. I, I do think there's a lot of, of that kind of reaction that men feel that they're losing their place of being the man and being in power and uh, feel castrated by the new world that is coming. And I think also we have a generation shift. I think and hope we will see a big dif difference when the next generation men are brought up in the world because they are being raised now by women who are more, you know, taking over the world. Uh, I'm, I have an 18 year old and an 11 year old. And I think, uh, I mean, I do have an important job in raising my daughters as strong women. I have an, I think even more important task in raising my boys to be fantastic, empathetic, generous, um, nice men. Estamos viendo entonces la última generación de abusadores o es demasiado a uh, wishful thinking? I think oh, abuse is always going to be there. Um, I, I think we're never ever going to get rid of that. It seems to be very deep in our human reactions and and you know, as a stereotype, men turn their anger outwards and women turn their anger inwards. And that's part of human nature, but it poses a much more important task on society. Uh, I, I'm a firm believer, for example, in giving women who are um, ab abused much more support from the state and the police it's pretty bad today they don't get much help and also i believe in rougher punishments for acts like that because if they don't listen to you know what's right from inside we have to show them from the outside to, to scare them to not commit these acts claro sin embargo también lo que lo que muestras en esta novela es que si bien no se puede confiar digamos en el sistema cuando, cuando ellas hablan de abuso o cuando ellas eh, hablan de, de sus problemas, lo que sí se puede confiar es en esta sororidad. Es decir, entre ellas se ayudan y entre ellas tratan de resolver, en este caso lo resuelven bastante bien, <ríe> resuelven muy bien los, los problemas. ¿Existe esta, esta sororidad dentro, de, dentro del ambiente en el que te desarrollas? ¿La encontraste ahí antes de encontrarla en el libro? Yes, I have to say that um, I've experienced both and I'm experiencing both. I have, uh, through my life, uh, become lucky enough to surround myself with fantastic women who empower me, who support me, who cheer me on, who help me. And I've kind of collected them through the years. I've picked the good ones. So today I have a fantastic you know, crew of women around me that I, I think is amazing. But I've also um, have the, the biggest amount of criticism I've re received. I mean, um, mostly since I became a mother and a public figure for the first time for 18 years ago. I had my first child 18 years ago. And I also started a blog. And I, I've, I've been a social media, I've had a social media presence. So I've been able to be reached by criticism. And I 
would say to 99%, it's been women who's been criticizing me from everything to how, what I do as a mother, to how I dress, to my weight, to how much I work, how much I don't. I mean, it's mostly women. And that's one of the points why I write so much about it because it fascinates me. We are our own worst enemies. We are absolutely our own worst enemies. We spend so much time guarding our positions to other women, to gossiping, to talking crap behind the back, to not helping each other. Instead, we're competing with each other. Uh, and I think it's sad and it needs to change. Ojalá, ojalá cambie. Sin embargo, estas mujeres deciden llevar a cabo, deciden eh, liberarse unas a otras. Eh, ¿Cómo se planea el crimen perfecto? Eh, de, 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 narrativamente hablando, por supuesto. <risa> Existe una... Uh, adelante, adelante, perdón. Uh, no, I think that in every book the, the crime kind of blends with the characters. So I usually create the characters first and then the, the nature of the crime comes quite naturally. But also I've got a big database to, to pick from. I'm a huge crime nerd. I'm, <laughs> I'm a, I, mean, I mean, I read... And ever since I was a child, I read so much about murder cases, murderers, serial killers, psychopaths, profiling, forensic medicine. I mean, <laughs> and I, the first time I came to, I've, I'll never forget uh, the book fair in Guadalajara, for example, because uh, I don't remember now quite which year I was there. It, it's been quite a few years. But the first thing they told me the night before I was going into the book fair, they said it, oh, last year they placed, I think it was like eight or 10 bodies without heads outside the entrance. And, and the proper response would be, oh my God, the pro if you're a crime writer, it's like, tell me more. So, <laughs> so we, we are kind of drawn to everything horrible and dark and crime. So I'm, I'm not very much a nerd when it comes to that. So I've got a lot of experience from different murder cases. Claro, decías hace un momento, primero planeo, planeo los personajes. ¿Qué, qué, ¿Cómo los planeas? ¿Escribes una gran biografía? Este, el, ¿Les creas un montón de situaciones que quizás no están en la novela? ¿Cómo es esa planeación de los personajes? I'm, I'm, I'm a very disorganized writer compared to a lot of my colleagues. I mean, I'm, I'm quite close friends with a lot of the Swedish crime writers. So we often talk about the various methods that we work with and they are all very organized. They have posted notes of the whole book. They have long, you know, several uh, sheets of paper up and down with where they have interviewed their characters before they start writing about them. They know their favorite movie, what kind of shoes they wear. <laughs> I just kind of start writing on the first page. And then I keep writing until the book is finished. I write chronologically. When I start, I know maybe 2% of the book. And so I kind of, I mean, this is going to sound very new age, but I kind of let the characters introduce themselves to me. So they usually come quite clearly to me when I start writing about them. It's like, here I am. This is me. <laughs> Entonces, ¿también te sorprendes de lo que hacen cuando llevan a cabo estos crímenes? Sometimes they can surprise me. Most of the time, not. Most of the time, I'm in control or I'm God, as I like to say. Uh, but um, I mean, all authors have a God complex. It's kind of what we do. We create universes. And uh, But yes, sometimes you have those magical moments where it feels like someone else is taking over the writing or it feels like someone else is standing behind your shoulder and dictates for you what's going to happen. I know that, I mean, logically, it's probably that subconsciously I've all, already solved the problems and I already know subconsciously what's going to happen. But anyway, that feeling is absolutely amazing. So, yes, sometimes they do surprise me. Estas mujeres planean liberarse unas a otras, es decir, cometer, cometer un crimen en favor de las otras. Eh, me hizo recordar, no sé si lo tenías en mente mientras lo escribías, a Patricia Hashmit y, y, y Extraños en un tren. Eh, en donde yeah. dos desconocidos eh, eh, tratan de intercambiar crímenes. Sin embargo, aquí 
no solo son do, dos desconocidos, sino tienen, digamos, objetivos muy precisos, que es aquel que las, que las, que la, que abusa de, de, de estas esposas. Eh, la, yeah. ¿La revisaste, la leíste? Eh, me refiero a Patricia Hashmit o no necesariamente. Yeah, I read it many, many years ago, and I think also Agatha Christie murder on the Orient Express is a bit of the same. So it's a theme that you know always repeats in in. Uh, but I've actually thought it is a very, very good way to um, to commit a crime, and I'm I'm kind of surprised that we don't have more real actual cases where this happened because <laughs> pe where people chain exchanged murders with each other because when i mean 90 percent of all murders are committed by someone in the near vicinity of the victim i mean the statistics mm -hmm. are that high so the police will all always start looking first at the family and the people the husband or the spouse or the people around them so by distancing yourself and exchanging murder with someone else is actually quite a good idea, but uh, it doesn't happen that often in real life. <laughs> es una lástima. Pero a qué se deberá, a qué es muy... I don't want to give any, no, anyone any ideas, though. <laughs> <laughs> eh, eh, bueno, déjame preguntarte ahorita que acabas de decir eso, déjame preguntarte, ¿hay alguien que haya tomado alguna idea o que haya sabido de alguien que diga, oh, Después de leer tu novela, pensé seriamente en matar a alguien. No, I really, really hope not. Uh, and and <laughs> I do, I, I have gotten the question through the years, of course, that aren't you afraid that you're going to inspire someone to do it? And I mean, you always have the catch in the rye story with John Lennon in the back of your head if you're a writer. But I don't think, you know, If people are that cuckoo, I mean, he would probably have been able to pick up a cornflakes package and read the instructions to kill John Lennon on the back of it. So <laughs> it, it hasn't anything to do with the book, really. A person like that would do it anyway. So, uh, but I do know that a lot of criminals watch a lot of like forensic shows and CSI, um, and they have actually. Uh, unfortunately, gotten a lot better at thinking of these things with leaving in DNA trace, et cetera, et cetera. So that has actually happened that they are watching um, true crime shows or forensic shows to learn what not to do. ¿Tú crees que también esta clase de novelas cumple una, una, un sueño soterrado del propio autor de poder llevar a cabo estos crímenes, aunque sea, por supuesto, en el papel y pues no, no, no estamos tan locos para llevarlos a la realidad, pero, pero sin duda para llevarlos al papel sí se necesita tener un poco de oscuridad dentro. Um, I actually believe that all humans are capable of killing someone else. I think it's, um, I mean, we're not far, we're just one second away from being cave people still. There's a very, very thin coating of, um, you know, social appropriateness in our society. Uh, for example, if someone threatened the lives of my children, I would absolutely be able to kill that person. So I have it in me as well. Or if my life in defense, if my life was threatened, of course, I would try to kill the other person if you tried to kill me. So that's what I mean by saying that we all have it in us. We're all able to uh, kill someone else. It's just we have different levels of thresholds. I mean, some people would kill for money. Some people uh, would kill for love, etc., etc. And some people would only kill if their life is threatened threatened. Um, but that's why I think psychopaths are so interesting because it's quite a known phenomenon. It's statistically and not that uncommon. Um, st for, I mean, scientists say that about 0.5% of uh, regular you know, population mm -hmm. are what is defined as a psychopath, someone who does not feel empathy or feel feelings. They just imitate how they see other people react. Um, and that's interesting because if you don't feel any remorse, if you don't feel any empathy, um, it's much more easy to kill someone. So that's eh, one of my fascinating topics that I love to talk about and read about. And yeah. Justo decías hace un momento que parece raro que no, eh, que no se mate más eh, utilizando este método de los desconocidos que intercambian, que intercambian objetivos. 
y, y, y supongo que tiene que ver por el hecho de que hay que tener una gran confianza en la otra persona, no solo de que es verdad vaya y mate el objetivo que tú has decidido, sino una especie hasta casi como de, 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 de intimidad, de cercanía. Eh, me pregunto si tu novela al final, el, prácticamente el capítulo final, hay una especie como de, de, de reconstrucción de esa amistad entre estas mujeres que no se conocían, pero que finalmente se construye la amistad a partir de eso. También querías decir eso, que había... Okay, okay, of course, okay. that's, a, that's a bond that they share and it's a common experience that ties them together. So I do have a picture in my head of them, you know, becoming friends. I see them kind of like the Madras Sex and the City girls, um, <laughs> 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 sipping their cocktails and enjoying life. And yeah. <laughs> <risa> Así me las imaginé justo en la página final que ya estaban este, disfrutando, sí. disfrutando su vida. Pero esto anima, sí. digamos, un poco a, a, a los lectores no a cometer el crimen, sino a sentir que pueden tener una relación eh, amistosa con otros que han sufrido abuso. Sí. Y les Like yes, I mean, of course, uh, when you write a crime novel uh, or you write about revenge, for example, I mean, I don't literally mean that people should kill off their abusive husbands and do it, you know, bond with other women to do it. It's, a, it's symbolical, uh, but my hope is when you read it, it's a, you will feel empowerment. It's mm. to feel that I can take the power over my own life. Uh, I can't do something about my situation because it's a hopelessness that keeps us trapped in a situation. If we feel we cannot leave, we're stuck in our hopelessness. So empowerment is something that, uh, apart from also being entertained, but if there's a feeling I would like the reader to take away is that, yeah, you go girls and I can do this and I can, yeah. So it's more about that than literally killing someone. Go Girls, ¿estás pensando en que tus, tus lectores son predominantemente lectoras o también tenemos cabida de los lectores en, en, en las novelas de Camila Lacna? I was very, very surprised when I started, when I started writing, I actually thought I wrote for a mainly female audience, uh, but to my big surprise, um, I have more male readers than I had ever thought I would have. Um, and I'm quite surprised by that. I'm very, very surprised by that. But I think I see that as a very good thing because I do write a lot from women's perspective of how we view the world and what the world is like for us. So I'm thinking that maybe I could get, you know, at least one guy to think that, okay, I think I need to change something about the way I uh, treat my wife or view the family dynamic or something like that. If you can reach just one person, I mean, it's, that's something fantastic. ¿Algún, algún hombre se ha acercado a decirte, yo la leí, me gustó muchísimo y, y, y he pensado sobre lo, que, sobre lo que has escrito? ¿O son casi siempre mujeres? No, when I, when I do signings, uh, I would say it's like one third men and two third women standing in line. I even have a Spanish guy who's tattooed my name on his neck that shows up every time I'm uh, signing in Madrid. He's very nice, though, <laughs> but, but he's got Camilla Luckberg on his neck tattooed. Um, and and um, yeah, it's, it's been quite a surprise to me, but I do, I do get a lot of appreciation from male readers for the books. And I had... A very endearing. In my third Fjallbaka book, um, I talk about my main character gets a postnatal depression. I had that with my first child, so I kind of wrote about it. And we all put our own shit in the books, you know, as writers, we all yeah. put everything personal in there. So I wrote about that and I received an, a letter, a handwritten letter from a reader, a man who was over 90 years old. And he wrote to me and said that When my wife had postnatal depression, when she ha had our first um, child, and we were talking, I mean, 65 years ago, said, I didn't understand. By reading your book, I first, I, for the first time, fully understand what she went through. And I want to thank you for that. And that was, 
that was one of the most fantastic. I, I mean, it's, I got this 12 years ago. I've never forgotten it. Mm. ¿Eso ha cambiado tu visión como escritora? Es decir, eh, acabas de decir que escribías desde una perspectiva eh, femenina y para, para lectoras. ¿Eso ha cambiado ahora cómo escribes? ¿También estás pensando en los lectores o no necesariamente? I'm very selfish when I write. I only write the kind of books that I want to read. And I think that I write very much from my reality and my perspective and, and my, for example, I'm not really comfortable with calling myself a feminist because there are a lot of women who are feminists who I don't agree with. We don't see things the same way. I don't think that the idea of, okay, guys, now you have ruled the world for 2000 years. Now it's our turn to rule the world and you can sit back. I believe that true equality is when it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, It uh, doesn't mean that men are, are, you know, need to get flogged now for a couple of hundred years. Uh, so I'm not that kind of feminist. I have a lot of fantastic men in my life. I mean, I've married three of them. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and I have a lot of male friends and I see a lot of fantastic examples of men who are fantastic husbands, fathers, uh, very equal. So I'm not you know, far out. Uh, I try to keep a very sound perspective, but of course, as a woman, it's um, the majority is a female perspective, but I very much enjoy since I often in my books change the view of the character. Uh, and I write from both male and female characters point of view. And I enjoy that very much because that makes me have to really think about it. Okay, what would a guy think in this situation? How would he react in this situation? And that creates a greater understanding. And that's a key to equality that we start actually understanding the other person. Claro, la literatura nos tiene que ayudar a ponernos en los zapatos del, de la víctima, del hombre o de la mujer y, de, y, y así nos podemos entender, entender un poco mejor. ¿Qué haces una vez que terminas sí. una novela? ¿Se, la, ¿Se las das a leer a, a amigos, amigas? Eh, te, ¿quién, ¿Quién te lee antes que nadie, antes que los lectores, por supuesto? Uh, no, it's my editor, because I want, before I start giving the manuscript to friends or family, I wanted to go through the first editing because they actually often have very good ideas <laughs> <laughs> and you need to wash the manuscript. Um, so, but after the first washing, I give it to my husband. So he's the first reader, but he's dyslexic. So it takes him so long to read it. And I'm like, oh, come, on, <laughs> come on, come on, come on, read faster, come on. <laughs> <laughs> y también tiene ideas, has cambiado cosas eh, que, que te han señalado tus, tus lectores, no editores. Well, no. The thing is that I give that exclusive no. right to my editor. I get very, very annoyed when someone tries to give me ideas while I'm working at the manuscript or when it's just finished. Only my editor gets away with that. And as I said, I've been married three times and I've had to teach my husband's how to deal with this because the first time I start talking about the story with them while I'm working on a manuscript, they are of the misperception that I actually want their advice. Uh, and then I have to tell them that, no, 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 no. You only say one thing and that's wonderful okay. here. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic, sounds amazing. That's your only job. <laughs> Alguien en alguna firma de libros, algún lector se ha acercado a decirte, oh, yo conozco un crimen maravilloso que deberías escribir o que de, del cual deberías informarte o oh, me gustaría quizás cometer un crimen yo mismo me gustaría contarte cuál ha sido la cosa más extraña que te han dicho al respecto en alguna firma de libros oh uh, apart from the guy with the tattoo my name tattoo uh, on his neck yes uh, um, <laughs> uh, well I, I do constantly get people who wants to give me their ideas and that happens not only in signings but through direct message for insta or mm -hmm. they email me and say i've got this great story you can have it 
or the most common thing is I said that, oh, I've, re- I've lived such a marvelous life. You can get to write the book about my life um, and then we can share the proceeds. You know, I get a couple of those per week. Um, so, uh, no, but, you know, in the in the signing line, anything can happen. Everything from I've been uh, tried to be picked up by giving phone numbers to being scolded for something I wrote or Anything can happen. Claro. Has, eh, han llamado, no sé, productores de tele, de, de cine para mujeres que no perdonan. Es tan ágil, tan clara, tan precisa lo que ocurre que sería fantástico. Um, it's always hard to talk about the discussions wow. you have about movies um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. and books, but I've actually just uh, gotten into the movie world myself. I've started a movie production company and we are just now producing our first uh, full feature movie. So um, I'm deep into that uh, work at the moment. ¿Y tiene que ver con alguna obra tuya? ¿Con alguna novela tuya? No, it's an original manuscript. It's a, a pandemic story, a love story in quarantine. So it's something different. No, no one, no one is murdered. <laughs> Qué lástima. <laughs> eh, <laughs> ahora justo con la, con la, con la pandemia te ha dado, eh, eh, has planeado alguna nueva novela que tenga que ver como con crimen en un espacio cerrado, en un espacio eh, tan, 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 tan asfixiante como la pandemia? Well, no, not apart from this movie, but I've been working on another movie, um, another book project. I'm writing a trilogy to, together with a colleague of mine and a very good friend of mine, Henry Frixios. So we have just finished the first book in a trilogy and um, it's called The Box. It's a crime story. It's a mentalist and a female cop that uh, solves crimes. In the first book, it's uh, magic tricks gone wrong. <laughs> las, las mujeres policías y, y los investigadores eh, tienen mucho éxito en, en, en los países, eh, digamos, más desarrollados, eh, porque de, de, en nuestros países no confiamos tanto en, en, en la policía. Eh, eh, ¿Crees que la figura del detective aún tenga ese atractivo de confianza? I do think so, but as you said, it is different from country to, to country, but um, I've actually been quite successful in, in Latin America, so I don't know if that's because it's starting to change or if it's just this fascination with this weird country up north where polar bears are walking the streets uh, but, <laughs> but I've gotten a lot of love from um, Latin and Central America and I, I very much enjoy that I once asked a Spanish journalist who's interviewed me several times and I also know she's a fan of the books so she's read all of them and she's very you know she, she knows a lot about them And I once asked her a couple of years ago, like, what's your fascination with these books? Because it seems like a very different society from, you know, in your Madrid life and little Fjallbaka and this small Swedish town. And she said that, well, my fascination is that I come from a very small Spanish town and I recognize life so much in this small Swedish town. And that's fascinating to me that we are so alike. I did not think that. And that was a key to me to understanding uh, that I think I found something that is human, not national, when claro, I write. Claro. Incluso estas mujeres son, eh, digamos, tienen estas vidas muy contemporáneas. Eh, una maestra de, 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 de escuela, una periodista. Quizás la única que tiene una vida un poco más rara es, es la, esta mujer rusa que tiene que, que entrar a un a un país extranjero y quizás sí. es la que es la que está más violentada en el sentido de que eh, no apenas si conoce el idioma supongo que salir a la calle debe ser un conflicto lo vemos en una de las escenas donde tiene que comprar cosas eso e, ese aislamiento tanto del territorio en el caso de, de, del, del, del pueblecito como una suerte como de aislamiento mental 
le permite a los personajes eh, actuar con, con revancha, yeah. con violencia. Yes, I think always when you feel powerless, as, as we have spoken before, and imagine coming, coming to a country, you have no friends, you have no family, you don't speak the language, you're so much in, in, in power of this person who uh, you're with. Uh, and it's not that uncommon in Sweden. It's, it's quite a phenomenon with Russian male order brides, brides or wives from, from Thailand. There, of course, there are couples that are very, you know, not, not that way. There are, you know, fairy tale stories as well, but it is a problem because you have a very unevil level of power in that relationship. Sin embargo, hay un personaje también muy interesante que es otra mujer, que es esta tailandesa que también está casada, digamos, con, con esta misma relación de, de abuso y, y, y no la presentas como que como un espejo de que, de que también hay gente que se acomoda a esa vida o como el espejo para Victoria de que no debe acomodarse a esa vida. Yes, it's, it's, it's a mirror to show both sides that, I mean, it's always a choice often to fight it or accept it. And especially if you have children, it's even more difficult because what are your rights going to be? You're in this foreign country. You don't even know the rules. Um, so I kind of wanted to show both sides there. Y, y esos dos... No, lo que pasa es que nos dejas la posibilidad de que también aceptemos un poco la, 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 esta, esta violencia y es, es un poco triste esta, este, este personaje que se adapta demasiado a sus propias condiciones, ¿no? Yeah, everything, and that, that, that's a strange thing. Everything becomes normal um, after mm. a while. That's also why you see the bad patterns repeating. Someone who's grown up with an alcoholic father is very prone to seeking an alcoholic spouse because it's normal. It's something you know. And, you know, the better you, the devil you know than the one you don't. Uh, <laughs> so because humans are so adaptable, it's our strength, but it's also our weakness that we can adapt to so much. And especially wives and children, mothers and children, they can, you know, take a lot for the sake of their children. It's a strength, but sometimes it's also a prison. Y sin embargo, la periodista que, que me parece que es uno de los personajes centrales, que es la que arma quizás el, 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 la trama de, las, de los asesinatos, tiene hijos. ¿Cómo lo resuelve? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. ¿Cómo resuelve este And conflicto de que... Also. Ah. And also to how do they, do you hurt your children by telling the truth about their father? Um, we go to, as women, we go to great lengths to protect our children and sometimes at the cost of ourselves. So that's, uh, I can understand that's a difficult line to draw in the sand. It's not an easy decision. A lot of people would like to make it an easy decision. It's not, it's complex. Claro. Y quizás ahí eh, esa, esa complejidad la vemos en Brigitte, que, que a pesar de que sus hijos son eh, mayores, están fuera de casa, eh, todavía siente necesidad de protegerlos de esta, de esta verdad. Eh, yeah. es, uno, es uno de los personajes más, más tiernos, no solo por, porque está enferma, sino porque trata de liberarse hacia el último... Yeah. hacia el último eh, fragmento cacho de su de su existencia cómo concebiste ese, ese personaje yeah. I saw her as I mean really quite strong but that she had chosen not to be that for many many years one of the women that were gradually broken down and choosing to live for the children instead her channel was the children that was her mission And that mission just doesn't, doesn't stop because when the children get old or move away from home, you don't stop being a mother uh, when the children leave your house. And I think that was a very important, um, important point to make for me with Birgitte, that the bond is just as strong, the responsibility is just as strong. And there's also an amount of shame 
involved. Women often feel shame, even though they are not the ones doing anything, but they take the shame upon themselves. Hay algo que, que tus lectores esperan ya de, de, de las novelas de Camila Lagbar. Hay, hay, est estamos esperando algo y eso te, te hace sentir comprometido como escritor o no necesariamente escribes con la mayor libertad. Well, as I said, I'm very selfish when I write. <laughs> and uh, the last few years, I've done a few projects that I've been to. I mean, I've had my Fjellbaka series, which has been hugely successful and been at like base of my, my, uh, my writer's career. Uh, but um, after 10 books, I felt that I want to tell another story. I started working on this story. I started working on The Golden Cage. Everyone around me told me I was crazy. I mean, mm -hmm. I had a very successful series already going. Why change it into something else? But that's the point of being a creative person, that you always have to do what you want to. You have to be very selfish and only write what you want to. I don't really care about what the readers want. I love my readers, but I don't care what they want from me. I give them something and I hope they love it. <laughs> Eso te permite, es decir, hasta... ¿Hasta qué punto eh, eh, eres capaz de cambiar de una novela a otra? ¿Sabes que hay cosas que te, que te gusta decir? ¿Sabes que hay cosas que te gusta señalar sobre, sobre la sociedad, sobre el mundo criminal? Eh, ¿Y hasta, cua, hasta qué punto tú dices, esto ya no, eh, esto lo voy a cambiar radicalmente para llevarlo a, a, otro, a otro grado? Este, hasta, hasta, dónde, ¿Hasta dónde has llegado? ¿Hasta dónde sientes que has llegado? In estos cambios. Well, I, I usually get an idea, and that idea is quite clear to me what I want to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I just kind of go and run with that idea. And sometimes uh, I have to also work on changing my language a bit. Some stories mm -hmm. are needs a different kind of language. This story needed a little bit of different language than the Fjellbaka stories. The Faye books requires another kind of change in the voice. Mm -hmm. uh, so that always takes me a little while when I start on a new project that uh, I, I think about it quite a long time because I have to find the perfect voice for that story. Este está armado muy, eh, muy bonito porque es, es una tras otra de la, los personajes. Cada capítulo es lo que va ocurriéndole con, eh, a, lo, a los personajes y eso siempre da la, la sensación, por un lado, de velocidad, la, la trama va corriendo bastante rápido, pero también de, de muchas posibilidades. Uno sí. siente que está, que está permeando el mundo. Así lo planeaste, que, estás, que a la hora que armaste... Eh, no la trama, sino realmente el armado del, del libro. Yeah, that, that idea came together with the idea for the book. That was quite, the structure came at the same time as the idea. So I knew that's the way I wanted to tell this story. So that was kind of the voice of that book. And uh, that's one of the things about how I view being an author, being a writer, that I never want to stop evolving. If I want to keep learning and growing and developing as a writer, I have to do things that I'm not quite sure how to do. I could mm. keep writing Fjallbaka books for the rest of my life, but that's very much in my comfort zone. I can step in and out of that world just like that. I know the voice, I know the characters. It's a lot of work, but it's easy. Um, and I'm not afraid anymore. I know it works. I'm very comfortable uh, with these other projects, mixing them in. Um, I get the little butterflies in my stomach uh, and I'm a little bit afraid that will the readers like this? Will they hate it? Will this flunk? And I kind of enjoy feeling that feeling that keeps me on my toes. Dices, sé lo que funciona y eso, eso me gusta mucho porque me permite hacerte una pregunta. Alguna vez entrevisté a una, a una escritora española y me dijo, sé que que no puedo escribir un buen cuento. Sé que el cuento no es mi, mi, mi género. Sé que la novela es mi género. Ahí me voy a quedar. No que, no que escriba siempre lo mismo, pero que sea la novela el género en el que yo, yo me siento confortable. ¿En dónde no te sientes confortable? ¿Has intentado alguna vez escribir 
teatro, cuento, eh, y, y has sentido que no, que no eres Camila Lackberg? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm very comfortable in one thing, and that's I see myself as a storyteller above all. And I, I know I'm a good storyteller. I might not be the most literary writer. I mean, I'm, I will never get the phone call in the middle of the night telling me I won the Nobel Prize in literature. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, I'm not that kind of writer, and I don't aspire to be. I'm very proud of being read by many people. I'm proud of being easily accessible or being part of more the pop culture than the fine culture. In Sweden, we have a very, it, it's a big division between the broad culture and the fine culture. And it's kind of looked down on what I do. And we, have, we kind of have this saying that uh, in the fine culture world, they kind of think that if a lot of people read your book, it can't be good. So if you have few writers, then it's probably a very fine and good literature book. Weird, <laughs> I know, it's weird. But I've never, I, it's never bothered me. I'm proud of being the people's writer. Eso me, me encanta porque es algo que, que parece como prohibido decir incluso, ¿no? Ah, claro, es que, 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 que gusten mis libros, que yeah. se vendan, que tengan éxito, parece una... Eh, una suerte como de venganza del, del comercio o de la, de, de, de la edición que de la literatura realmente, ¿no? Y tú lo llevas muy bien, tú lo cuentas con toda facilidad. Es decir, has aprendido a ver, a ver así la literatura y has aprendido a que esa es tu, 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 tu literatura. I don't think I've learned it. I think it's always been quite natural to me also because I know I've always been an avid book reader when I was a child I was constantly reading had my nose in a book and I've read everything from Gabriel Garcia Marquez to um, to Jackie Collins I've never to <laughs> Barbara Cartland I've never viewed anything as bad literature I mean one day you want to read Dostoevsky the other day you want to read some chiclet book it depends on my mood And why should I pick just one kind of literature to read? I mean, it's stupid. I mean, it's actually stupid. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've never had a problem with that. And I've always been very proud of being read by many. And I also think that the writers who says that they'd rather have few and the right readers than many, I think they're lying. I think everyone wants to be read by a lot of people. That's why we write to be read. Claro. Háblame justo de tus preferencias literarias. Ahorita acabas de mencionar muchos, pero ¿qué te gusta leer? ¿Qué le gusta leer a, a, a Camila Lagba? I've always read about 80% crime and 20% a total mix of everything from Nobel Prize winners to Chiclet. Uh, but I've always been a huge crime fan. It started with Agatha Christie and I also include um, horror fiction that Stephen King, for example, uh, I love, love, love. Um, and I've always been drawn more to the Anglo-Saxon tradition than the American one, with one exception, Michael Connolly, but otherwise I read a lot of English Crime, uh, crime writers, um, Peter Robinson, for example, Scottish Dennis Minor, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera, et cetera. Reginald hay, Hill. Hay muchas mujeres que han destacado en, el, en la novela negra, en la novela criminal, ¿a qué a, lo atribuyes? ¿Crees que hay alguna razón? Me estoy refiriendo a Agatha Christie, me estoy refiriendo a, a, a Patricia Highsmith y desde luego a Camille Lackler. I don't know. I think maybe Agatha Christie started something when she became successful and she she was among the first women who were successful in that field. So I my I think that maybe we have her to thank for women thinking that, oh, I could actually do that. I also think we have a keen eye for human nature and crime writing is about human nature. It's all about human nature. Because we're so interested in relationships and that's where it always goes wrong in the interaction between humans. 
dices, tiene que ver con, con, con las relaciones interpersonales, pero también te importa mucho el poder, lo has mencionado mucho a lo largo de la, de la charla y de la entrevista, ese es uno de los elementos clave de toda novela, de toda novela negra. Absolutely. I think power is key in all stories when people are involved because we're all playing a power game all day long. We're doing it at home. We're doing it at work. Uh, we're doing it in politics. We're doing it in, in you know, interaction with friends. Uh, I mean, we, we, as I've said before, we're basically still Stone Age people and, you know, we're competing about being the alpha males or the women, woman who decides in the village. Um, that's our way to be secure, to be the one who have power. That's a way that we, we uh, that we're not excluded from the group because, you know, historically, if you're excluded from the group, the tiger will come and get you. Claro. Naturaleza humana, poder. Esas cosas nunca se van a terminar. Eso quiere decir que los crímenes nunca se van a terminar y las novelas criminales tampoco. Yeah. Vamos a tener, vamos a tener Camila Lagwer para mucho tiempo. I hope so. I'm taking my vitamins every day. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'll always, I'll, I'll always write uh -huh. uh, in some form. I do not know uh, in what form. I mean, I'm doing movie scripts now. I've done song lyrics, short novels, long stories. Um, so I, I, children's books, cookbooks. I, I dabble in like every kind of writing because to me, I'm a writer. That's what I do. I'm not a novelist. I'm a writer. I like to tell a story. Nunca hubiera imaginado lo de las canciones. Eh, hay, eh, ¿Alguien las ha retomado? Es, está, ¿Las podemos conseguir en Spotify? ¿Alguien las canta? Yeah, there are some, uh, some on Spotify. Some of them in Swedish, but some of them in English. Ah, las buscaremos inmediatamente. Y tampoco hubiera imaginado lo de los libros infantiles. ¿Hay crímenes en los libros para niños? <risa> no, but it's a superhero. I just released the tenth in a series, actually, Super Charlie. So they've ah. been quite successful. ¿Cuál es la diferencia? ¿Cómo abordas eh, eh, el cómo escribes para niños y, y, y la diferencia entre escribir crímenes para adultos? Oh, it's much harder writing for children. They're a tough crowd, let me tell you. I mean, they're the toughest critics. If a kid don't like it, it's pretty obvious. So uh, it, it's, it's um, yeah, I think it's quite difficult to write for children, but it's also a ton of fun. ¿Has visto cómo, cómo han recibido eh, tus libros infantiles? Yes, I, I mean, I always try them out on my four ch children. I have quite a nice jury selection. Uh, and, I do, <laughs> and I do get a lot of reactions from parents, uh, school teachers who are sending me, you know, reports on the children. And I have, sometimes have children coming up and want my autograph because I'm super Charlie's mom. So. <laughs> <laughs> Qué maravilla. Invítanos a leer Mujeres que no perdonan, Camila. I have to say that, uh, do you know that in Sweden, we have a tradition on Fridays. In, in, in Sweden, I mean, basically everyone is eating tacos on Fridays and we call it Taco Friday. <laughs> really, I'm not joking. It's a, it's a Swedish thing. Like most Swedish families eat tacos on Fridays and it's Taco Friday. Ah, entonces, yeah. eh, viene muy bien el, el Taco Friday leyendo a Camila Lagbar. Yeah, perfect. Camila, te agradecemos muchísimo la, la charla, te agradecemos muchísimo tu sentido del humor y esperamos, esperamos tener pronto un nuevo libro en español de Camila Lagmar. So Amigos, muchas gracias por acompañarnos, muchas gracias por estar con nosotros en esta charla con Camila Lagmar, gracias a Grupo Editorial Planeta. Y desde luego a la FIL de Guadalajara. Muchas gracias.